again, my name is Richard Stepanik, and you know I work with Health Mega, Mega Institute. And you've seen some of my partners in crime, you might say, Dave and Mary Jo Netting, and, and also I think Brian Mariani maybe is taught here. And so this is my first time. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And when Bill Browning, who I have known for quite a few years now, and asked, called a few months ago if I would come and teach, and I said, sure, but I'll probably teach on something different because a lot of you are an ex experts on a number <laughs> of different scientific fields. So I didn't want to copy something that you already know, so I picked out something that was different. So what we're going to take a look at here this evening is we're going to take a look at, really not going to take a look at the origin of the science of creation. We'll talk a little bit about that, but my main thrust tonight is the origin of the religion of evolution. Yes, a lot of people say, what is an evolution science? So we're going to take a look at it. Evolution is a religion. It's a philosophy posing as science, and we're going to go to the origin. Who came up with the idea, the concept of evolution? But first, we're going to start with just a little bit of the origin of the science of creation. Now, according to scripture, God created everything in six days. He created time, light, heaven, and water on day one. On day two, he made the firmament, which I look at as outer space because he put the stars in the firmament. So he made the firmament on day two. He made the land and plants on day three. He made the sun, moon, and stars on day four. Swimming creatures and flying creatures on day five. And he made them and designed them to create after their own kind. They were created after their own kind to reproduce after their own kind. Then on day six, he made the land animals and then finally man. And again, everything was made to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, which is a very scientific term when you take a look at biolo biology. So we're going to take a look at, when we look at a quick view of Genesis chapter 1, life comes from life. God created life, which means life cannot come together by natural processes. Because God created life, which means life came from life, because God is life. Everything reproduces after their own kind. There'll be small changes to adapt to their environment. This is just to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, which I would call speciation. Do creatures change a little bit? Yes, they are programmed to change a little bit so they can adapt different food sources and environments. And then a common design from a common designer, so we should see evidence of engineering. And also, everything was created very good. And as we take a look at mutations, mutations cause a loss of genetic information. So creatures are not getting better. They're what I would call devolution. They're getting worse. We're genetically falling apart. And if you look at scripture, the universe is only a few thousand years old. So we look at this. Is this observational? Yeah, look at the law of biogenesis. Life only comes from pre-existing life, which means the first life on this planet had to come from who? An eternal living being. Is this observational? Yes, everything reproduces after their own kind. Is there evidence of engineering in creatures? Yeah, this is observational. Is everything created very good? Yes, and are things getting worse? Yes. And when we take a look at carbon-14 and diamonds, coal, dinosaur bones, and there's a lot of evidence that the universe is not billions of years old, but very, very young. So I look at this as the origin of the science of creation. For it to be scientific, it has to be what? Observational. Do we observe this? Yes, we do. Now, then we had the flood. What happened about 4,000 years ago, which caused a lot of catastrophic geology. And we look at the Grand Canyon, and we've got a lot of geology over there at Grand Junction. And we see a lot of evidence of a lot of water and not a lot of time. So we see a lot of catastrophic events. So I look at this as the creation, uh, the origin of the creation of science, or science of the origin of the science of creation, get that out. But also what I need to talk about is when were angels created? This is very important, especially if you want to understand the origin of evolution. What does the creation of angels have to do with the origin of evolution? We're going to take a look at that. Now you don't see the creation of angels in Genesis chapter 1, and I believe there's a good reason why. Because everything that God mentions in Genesis in Genesis chapter 1 is put underneath man's dominion. He had dominion over the earth and over the flying creatures and the creeping creatures and the whole universe. So when Adam sinned, it had a rippling effect through what was put underneath his dominion. Angels are not underneath man's dominion. They're only underneath God's dominion. So God talks about making angels in another part of scripture. We're going to take a look at that. First we go to Exodus 20.11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. 
We look at this verse, God made everything that is in the earth, in the heaven, and in the sea in these six days, and angels are called the host of heaven. And what day did God create heaven? Day number one. Can there be any angels created for day number one? No, there can't be any angels because there's no heaven created yet for them to be in. Are you with me? Because they're called the host of heaven. We take a look at Ezekiel 28. In this chapter here in Ezekiel, God is talking about anointed, anointed cherub. He's talking about a cherub, which is an angel. It doesn't say in the context here in this chapter, but I believe he's talking about Lucifer. This angel was created on a day. It's mentioned in verse 13, and it's also mentioned on 15. He was created on a day. Were there any days before Genesis 1-1? No, there were no days before Genesis 1-1, which means angels had to be made on one of the six days of creation. Does that sound logical? It does to me, because I think weird. So this is... So we're going to take a look at this. What day were the angels made? We're going to take a look at Psalms 104. Now you have to be careful with the Psalms, because it's written in Hebrew poetry. If you take everything literally in the Psalms, you can get trees and rocks dancing and singing, so you have to be careful. You have to take a look at the context. But we're going to compare Psalms 104 with Genesis. Genesis is written in narrative prose, which means you read Genesis as you would read a history book. Okay, all with me so far. So we're going to go through Psalm 104 compared to Genesis, chapter 1. Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Here we have light and we have heavens, plural. Is singular and plural very important? Yes, it is. That S makes a big difference. Yes. Verse 3, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the water. So now we have waters. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven, singular, and earth. And he talks about the deep, which is a reference to water. And waters, you know, you know what water means, right? It means waters. Yes, waters mean waters. And he got light. So here we have heaven, singular, earth, water, and light. Yes. Day 1, we have time. Heaven, singular, earth, which I believe is water. I don't go into the details in this topic. My Genesis chapter 1, I go into more detail. And then we have light. So we take a look at Genesis chapter 1. This is what we have in the end of day 1. Light's coming from one direction. We have one round ball of water, which is the matter. We have one three-dimensional space. You're probably a little confused here. Well, just bear with me. <laughs> My Genesis chapter 1 goes step by step, and I break this all down. You're getting quick you know, concentration here. So then we go to day 2. God said, let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made a ferment and divided the waters which were under the ferment from the waters which were above the ferment, and it was so. So God separated the waters from the waters. What did he put in between? The firmaments. And he called the firmament heaven. Now, this is what we have at the beginning of day two. God's going to divide the waters from the waters. So we've got a round ball of water. He divides the water. This little bit of earth, water right here, he's going to make the earth out of. This is the earth that we live on today. Right above that is the firmament, which I would call outer space. And above that, we have water. So this is what we have at the end of day number two. He made the firmament, and he called the firmament heaven. Now we have at least two heavens. We had one heaven on day one. We got another heaven he made on day two. So that's at least two heavens. And according to Corinthians, Paul says there's how many heavens? Three. Where are the three heavens? Heaven number one, according to scripture, is the earth's atmosphere. Heaven number two is where God's going to put the sun, moon, and stars on all the planets. That's a firmament. Because on day four, he says he put the, the stars in the firmament. And then above this water here is heaven number three, and I believe that's where God has his throne. There's the three heavens. That man was, went up into this heaven. Yeah. So, in Psalms, Psalm 104, 2, who covers thyself with light, as with a garment who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So here we have light, and we have heavens, plural. On day two, we have heavens, plural. I'll repeat this again, in case you're a little confused. 
The heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. So God's main throne in this universe is in the heaven. We go to Psalm 104 verse 3. Who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters. The beams is kind of like the foundation, the structure. Chambers, in my viewpoint, as I read in the Hebrew, it's like the upper throne, the upper chamber. So, Psalm 29.10. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, this Lord sitteth king forever. When I take a look at this verse, this word flood cannot mean Noah's flood because he sits on that water forever. The flood didn't last forever, did it? It lasts for about one year. So he's not talking about Noah's flood here. So he is sitting, his throne is sitting on water. What does it say? The beams of his chambers are in the waters. Yes. Now we go back to here. This is what we have at the end of day two. According to Psalm 104, after God gets this done, then he builds his throne, and he prepares his throne in the heavens. So I believe he puts his throne, and the foundation of his throne, upper chamber, is in the water, which is in the third heaven. And that's where Paul or Paul's friend went when you read 2 Corinthians. Now, again, the, earth, the heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. Now, verse 4. Who maketh his angel spirits, his ministers of flaming fire. After he gets this done, the next step he makes what? Angels. So it's a clear reference to angels because you can go to Hebrews and they have the same verse. So he makes angels. After he gets this done, he makes angels. This L is for Lucifer and all these other A's are for the other angels. And I believe he makes them in the water. I can't, I don't see that in scripture. It comes from other sources, as I will show you later. Yes. So, after he makes the angels, the next thing, in verse 5, who lays the foundations of the earth. Well, when I was doing research on this, I always wondered, what is the foundations of the earth? What is God talking about? Then I got thinking, okay, going back to Genesis chapter 1, what's a good foundation? If you're going to build a house, what do you want to build it on? Rock, or do you want to build it on water? Okay, what day did he make the land? Day number three. So when I, talk, when I look at the foundations of the earth, in Job, talks, God talks about, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? So when I look at the foundations of the earth, that's day three. So God turned a lot of the water into land. Most of the water went into land. Most of the earth is not water. Most of the earth is actually, when you look at it, is land. So we go to Psalm 104 again. Day one. God makes or creates time, heaven, singular, waters, and light. Day two. He makes the firmaments. Now we've got time, heavens, plural, waters, and light. We've got heavens, heavens. Day three, God makes land. Here we have day three. So this here is day two. This here is day three. And between day two and day three, what do we have? Angels. So when did God make the angels? Well, I believe he made them in the latter part of day two or the first part of day three, somewhere in that time frame. Interesting. So, the end of day two, God made angels, and he made the angels before he made the land. This is very important. This will come up again in the origin of the religion of evolution. You're thinking, what does this have to do with evolution? We're going to talk about that. So when I take a look at the creation week, sometime in this period, God made the angels. So the angels were created between Genesis chapter 1, 8, verse 8 and verse 9, if you want to put it in. Genesis chapter 1, that's between those two verses when he made the angels. Now, in the end of day 6, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Everything he made was good. Darkness was good. 
The serpent is good. Lucifer is good. That's what it says. So that means Lucifer could not have fallen before the end of day six, could he? It had to be sometime after day six, and the Bible tells us when he fell. It's not a mystery. Yes, interesting. Information's there. Now, we're going to change gears now. The origin of the religion of evolution. Yes. What is evolution? You know, most people really don't understand what evolution is. Evolution is non-life. The chemicals and the energy of the earth and the sun puts these you know, elements together into more complex molecules. This is what we call biochemical evolution or chemical evolution. Then these chemicals come together to form the first life. This is called abiogenesis or spontaneous generation. This first life evolves into the fish stage, the amphibian stage, reptilian, the mammal, caveman, ape man, and all the way up to mankind. This is what we call macro evolution. This is a big change. Going from particles to people is what we call mega. That's a bigger change. Evolution just means change. There's micro. Micro is biblical and also scientific. We're going to talk about micro. Now, also according to evolution, they believe we evolved from chimpanzee-like creatures. Why do people believe we evolved from chimpanzee-like creatures? Because we have a lot of bone structure similar to chimps. So when we take a look at evolution, this whole chart is built on what? Similar characteristics. Homology. Why don't they put fish up here? Why don't they put the monkeys down here and the fish up here? Well, we seem to have more similarities in bone structure with chimps than we do with fish. Are you all with me here? You're probably all this is probably nothing new to you. Yes. So we look at this. What does evolution teach? Non-life evolved into life. Chemicals can organize themselves. Similar characteristics as evidence of evolution, especially in the bone structure. One kind can evolve into a completely different kind of creature. Creatures are getting better. They're evolving upward. And have to have enough time for all this to happen. This is evolution. Yes. Now, new scientists. Darwin was wrong. I don't know if you've seen this magazine or not. Cutting down the tree of life. We knew about this information a long time before they came out with this. They finally catch up with the information that's been there. What? 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 Uh, what what's the date of that? That date is January 24, 30, 2009. Okay. So what? I'm just I just pulled out a few of the quotes in the magazine. Now it's not a creation magazine. He never believed in creation. He had another idea about how everything got here. That that's worse than Darwin's idea, in my viewpoint. <laughs> okay, but. These are some of the things in the article. For a long time, the Holy Grail was to build a tree of life. What was the tree of life? This is the evolutionary tree of life. Not the tree of life in Genesis chapter 2. That's a different tree. So all these creatures came from a common ancestor. They were trying to build the tree of life in 2009. Well, if they were trying to build a tree of life in 2009, what did they have before 2009? They must have not had a what? Tree of life. You go on. A few years ago, it looked as though the grail was within reach. But today, the project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. Negative evidence for what? Darwin's evolutionary tree. We have no evidence at all that the tree of life is a reality. According to this article, there is absolutely no scientific evidence that that tree even exists. Zero. Wow. This is coming from evolutionists. So what happened? In a nutshell, DNA. DNA is no friend to evolution, is it? <laughs> DNA screams out creation. What happened was when they started doing the genome, they couldn't take the whole human genome and they couldn't take the whole animal kingdom genome and make an evolutionary tree. If you take the whole genome all together, which you, it's, you just can't pick and choose your genes. You gotta take the whole genome. Take it all or none of it. 
When you use the whole genome, they couldn't get an evolutionary tree. Depends on what gene they took. Depends on what evolutionary tree they got. Isn't that interesting? Here's Darwin's book. His evolutionary book. He makes this tree. On the top of the page, he puts, I think. That's a pretty scientific concept, isn't it? <laughs> I think. That's philosophical. There's nothing scientific here. It doesn't exist. This is also, this is a picture right out of the book. The tree of life of one of the iconic concepts of evolution has turned out to be a figment of our imagination. Doesn't the Bible warn us about vain imaginations? That's all this is, is vain imagination. So they can't make an evolutionary tree. Depends on which gene you use. And that's one thing I like to, when I watch evolutionary shows, when they're dealing with the DNA, they never take the whole genome. They only pick the genes that they want to use. Yes. Interesting. Because if you use another gene, you can get another evolutionary tree. Wow. So as we take a look at science, science is no friend to evolution, because what does science do to the tree of evolution? Cuts it down. He came up with another idea, and I think that's worse than the first idea. But he just can't believe the true science. That's everything was created. Romans 1, 18 and 19. Who hold the true and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God hath showed it unto them. There's no excuse. The information's all there. Now, the red panda and the giant panda. I was taught at one time they were closely related. Why were they closely related? They had a lot of similarities. They both had an extra thumb, they both had a V-shaped jaw, they both had similar teeth, and they both had similar skull. Since they had similarities, they must have been what? Related, isn't that evolution? Is that similar characteristics, homology? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Denton. Evolution of Theory in Crisis, wonderful book. He's got another book out there, Evolution of Theory Still in Crisis. It's not getting better, it's getting worse for them. This comes right out of his book, The Systematic Status and Biological Affinity. What's affinity? Affinity in biology is a relationship or resemblance in structure between species that suggests a common origin. Basically, if you have similarities, they must be what? Related. Yeah. Okay. Affinity of a fossil organism is far more difficult to establish than in the case of a living form. We're living forms. So this, this relationship in the fossil record, it's, it's hard to build. Why? And can never be established with any degree of certainty. Why? To begin with, 99% of the biology of any organism resides in the soft anatomy, which is inaccessible, mostly inaccessible in the fossils. Because most of it's the hard anatomy that's fossilized. Are you all with me? 99% of what makes us unique is not in the bones. It's in the what? Soft tissue. The muscles, the organs, the skin. That's what makes you unique. It's not the bone structure. So we take a look at the chimpanzee. Why do they believe that chimpanzees, or chimpanzee-like creatures, evolved into man? Because of what? Similar bone structure. How much information in the bone structure, according to Michael Denton? 1%. Yes. Lucy. You know, they only found about 28 to 40% of the skeleton. So for you math people, how much information? It's like 0.28%. It's like one-third of a cent on the dot. There's not enough information to get any relationship there. Are you with me? There's only enough information there that says, yeah, that looks like a variation of a chimp, and, and we've got variations of humans. For relationship, there's not enough information. So Lucy, being her ancestry, is all built on speculation, not built on observational evidence. Yes. So we go back to here. Now with DNA testing, which is basically, most of it's in the soft tissue, DNA test says no, they are not related. These are related to bears and these are related to raccoons. So when they looked at this heart anatomy, only 1% of the information, they said, oh yeah, they're related. But when you start looking at the soft tissue, they are not related. When you take a look at their evolutionary tree, it's all built on what? Heart anatomy. There's not enough scientific evidence to get anything out of that. Can you imagine if somebody went to court and they only had 1% of the information? The judge would throw them out. Similarities only mean they have 
similarities. It doesn't mean they have to be related. So we take a look at non-life, evolved in life. Is there any evidence for that? Zero, that's never been observed. Similar to characteristics, is that really evidence of evolution? No. One kind evolve into another kind. Have we ever observed one kind of creature change into another kind? You know, a few years ago, I was at a university questioning some students. I asked one student if uh, she believed in evolution. She said, yes. And I said, why? Because of bacteria. Then I asked a very hard question. What do bacteria always change into? And she thought, she thought, she thought. And you know what she came up with? Bacteria. Bacteria do one scientific thing. They always are fruitful, multiply, and they always adapt to their environment. Genesis chapter 1, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's all they do. Darwin's finches. Guess what? They, all they did is be fruitful, multiply, and fill Galapagos Islands. That's all they did. There's not, one, there's not one scrap of Darwinian evolution here. Did you know that? All they did was just basically adapt to different food sources and different environments. That's all they did. This is nothing new. If you want to understand this, you know who you talk to? Talk to a farmer. He understands this very well. Dealing with farming, we deal with this all the time, different characteristics in livestock. No. So, we never observe one kind of creature change to another kind of creature. Are creatures are getting better? Are they really evolving upward? No. We don't observe this. Enough time for things to evolve? Well, we know there's problems in these dating methods. So we take a look at this. <coughs> Science does not support evolution. So where does a belief in evolution come from? Isn't that interesting? Now, <coughs> all of what I have just shown you, none of this has, none of this has ever been observed, have, have, has it? None of it. For it to be scientific, it has to be what? At least it has to be observable. We never observed anything. This is a Grolier Encyclopedia because evolutionary events in the past are not amenable to direct observation or experimental verification. The processes of evolution over the course of Earth's history must be inferred as guesswork. Boy, that's scientific. <laughs> I think it'll feel good. <laughs> All right. Well, I like to ask people, well, who came up with the idea of evolution? Charles Darwin. Yes. But is evolution a new concept? Did he come up with a concept? No, he didn't come up with anything new. The, his basic teachings of his theory, uh, if you can call it a theory, somebody else already came up with the information. We're going to talk about that. He basically, in my viewpoint, probably just plagiarized. You go back to the Bible, Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens, Greece. He's running into two types of philosophers that are giving him some problems. He's running into the Epicureans. Who are the Epicureans? They're atheistic evolutionists, very similar to modern day Darwinists. Atheism is nothing new, it goes way back. Then he ran into the Stoics. Who are the Stoics? They were pantheistic evolutionists, very similar to our modern day New Agers. I don't know why they call it New Age. All the basic teachings of New Age can be traced back to Genesis chapter 3. Did you know that? They're all there. Yeah, so basically, New Age is old age paganism in the Garden of Eden. That's all it is. Yeah. And then there was a Greek philosopher named Aristotle. lived around 330 BC. He came up with the idea of spontaneous generation or abiogenesis. You know, many of the Greeks taught that decaying meat would evolve into flies, horse hairs falling into water troughs, changed into this, to snakes and all that kind of spontaneous generation stuff. And he also taught since the goo or slime in rivers and uh, lakes had similar characteristics to eel and fish, he taught that the goo evolved into eel or, eels or fish. Have you heard that before? Yeah, I just taught you right here. The goo, first life evolved into what? Fish. This is nothing new. This goes back hundreds of years, thousands of years. This is from the ICR Museum. That was the one that was in California, Great Chain of Being. Basically what it deals with, it deals with a cosmic all God. And this breaks down through spirit beings to human beings to animals down to dust to atoms and continues down through the process. All God, spirit beings, man, then it continues down through the animals, then dust and atoms. That's the Great Chain of Being. Now, I've been to India. You know what? The, what they do in India, they just take the same thing and just reverse it. That's Hinduism. Well, it's a little bit different, but it's basically the same. 
The goal is to become one with all God. Interesting. Well, we'll go on. Probably started with Plato. I don't think so. I think it went back before, even before his day. Augustine and other medieval scholars suggested that to their theology. That was a mistake in my viewpoint. And then it goes on. Pre-Darwin evolutionists used this idea. Buffett and Lamarck adapted it to their concept of evolutionism by reversing its direction. Taking the same direction and just going up that way. Take off the spirit beings and all that because they're dealing with materialism. Just go up that. Basically, this is a great chain of being. Just modified. And then it goes on. Most modern evolutionary arguments are indebted to the great chain of, for their development, including evidence for a comparative homology, embryonic recapitulation, and the whole geological column. Again, this is basically the great chain of being. Just modified. So it's nothing new. No. No. Evolution. What does evolution teach? Animals will eventually evolve into what? Humans. Isn't that evolution? This idea is nothing new. Did you know that? Yeah, animals are linked to human origins. This is myths encyclopedia. Myths and legends of the world, animals and mythology. Animals are linked to human origins as well as the origin of the world. Many Native American clans believe they were descendants from animals. And the Ye Ho people in southern China trace their origins to the dog ancestry. So this whole belief that we evolved from animals is nothing new. The pagans believed it. It goes back thousands of years. Isn't that interesting? Darwin didn't come up with anything new. If you go to the people, the natives in Papua New Guinea, if you tell them that they evolved from monkeys, they'll think they're great. You'll think they'll think you're crazy. They live with the monkeys. They don't want to come from monkeys. They're dumb. But they believe they evolved from the birds. They're smarter. Isn't that interesting? They walk on two legs all the time. Isn't this interesting? So we evolving from animals is an ancient pagan religion. It is nothing new. <coughs> The oldest account of evolution goes back to the Sumerians, Egyptians, and the Babylonians. In the beginning was eternal water. Then out of the eternal water evolved, which is non-life, evolved two major gods, then at the same time a number of minor gods. Isn't that interesting? Which is evolution. Now, matter can organize itself into life. Gods in the midst, midst of the water. Ezekiel 28 talks about the son of man. Say unto the prince of Tyrus. This is a king. This is a human being. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up, became, he became prideful, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Oh, so here we got the prince of Tyrus. He believes he's a God in the midst of the waters. Where does he get that idea from? We're going to talk about that. Now, again, you have to understand this. Non-life evolves into more complex molecules. Biochemical evolution. Evolves in the first life. That evolves into the fish kind, all the way up to mankind. Again, that's macroevolution or particles to people, which is mega evolution. And what's the evidence of all this evolving? Why do they put apes up here by man? Similar characteristics. Yes. So again, Non-life evolved in life. Chemicals can organize themselves. Similar characteristics. One kind evolve into a completely different kind. Creatures are evolving upward. Enough time for all this to happen. I want to drill this into your brain before I can go on. Because we're going to talk about this. Now, did you know, we take a look at this. This is all speculation. It's not observational science. It's a belief. It's a religion. Since evolution is not a science, but only a belief or religion or a philosophy posing as science, so who is the originator of the evolutionary myth? Darwin didn't come up with the idea. Romans and the Greeks didn't come up with the idea. And I don't think even the Sumerians and Egyptians came up with the idea. So who came up with this idea if there's no scientific evidence for it? Are you all with me so far? OK. Again, we've got to go make your Look at evolution. What's evolution? Goo evolves in the fish kind all the way up to mankind. Lower kinds evolve or change in the higher kinds. All this is supposed to take millions and billions of years. Really, just enough time for this to happen. Okay, now, 
If you study the New Age movement, they will teach you if you have the right food and the right knowledge, you can become as who or what? Gods. What process do you have to go through to change from a lower mankind to a higher God kind? What do we call that when you go from a one kind to another kind, higher kind? What is that called? It's called evolution. This is the same process that the lower fish kind changed into higher amphibian kind. It is an evolutionary process. The foundation for the New Age movement is evolution. You destroy evolution, you destroy the foundation for a New Age. It collapses. Now, where have you heard that before? If you have the right food and the right knowledge, you can become as God or as the gods. Anybody hear, anybody hear that before? In the garden, yes. Serpent's in there talking to the woman. It says, if you have the right food and right knowledge, you can become gods knowing good and evil. Isn't that interesting? Which means going from mankind into God kind is an evolutionary concept. That means the first man and the first woman didn't come up with the idea of evolution. Darwin didn't come up with the idea of, deal of evolution. The Greeks and the Romans didn't come up with that idea. The Sumerians and the Egyptians didn't come up with the idea. The first man and woman didn't even come up with the idea of evolution. Who came up with the idea of evolution? Satan. Satan. Now we've got to take a close look at Lucifer. Let's look at Lucifer. This is what I believe Lucifer looks like. I don't know for sure. This is before he fell. We used a bunch of verses, and I had an artist that kind of put it together. That's just my rendition, rendition of Lucifer. Now we westernized him a little bit. We put a Texas Longhorn head on him. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, now we've got to take a look at Lucifer. It is his idea that things can change into something else and evolve upward. Let's go to Isaiah 14, verses 12 and 14. Verse 12 talks about Lucifer, so we know who we're talking about here. Lucifer says, I will be like the Most High. Well, Lucifer is in the angel kind, but what kind does he want to become? God kind. What do we call that when you go from one kind to another kind? It's called what? Evolution. This is macro evolution. Yes. Also, will be like is a future tense of a verb, which means given enough time, Lucifer believes he's going to become what? God. Given enough time, goo will he turn into you by way of the zoo. So the whole enough time for evolution did not come from man, it came from this guy. Are you with me here? Now we're stepping out of the material realm, now we're into the spiritual realm. Wow. Satan needs time, and maybe lots of it, for him to evolve into God. With enough time, anything can happen, right? When I'm talking to atheists, that's what they always say. With enough time, anything can happen. Do things get better over time? Give enough time? I don't know about you, but I'm falling apart. I can't wait till I get the new model. Oh, things are not getting any. Lucifer is a created being. So he did not exist before God started his creation work, did he? What day does he come on the scene? In the day two or the first part of day three? He misses day one and two. So Satan does not know how much time has passed since the universe came into being and when he was created. Do you know how much time passed before you were born or you became where you can recognize things? No, we've got to take someone else's word for it, don't we? Isn't that interesting? That's the same way with Satan. He's got to take someone else's word for it. Lucifer believes in evolution, and I also believe if he believes that millions of years may have passed for him to evolve into an angel being. He also believes with enough time he will evolve into a... Uh, that's what the Bible says. So. And he is known as a liar, and he's the father of all lies. When I study evolution, I find out there's no evidence for evolution. I used to be an evolutionist for 34 years until I went to an Alpha Mag Institute seminar. He opened my eyes to all this scientific inf information that evolution is not true. Yeah. So Lucifer is the father of all lies, including evolution. Yeah. We're going to take a look at where did he go wrong? Is Lucifer a very intelligent, bright creature? Yes. Where did he go wrong? <laughs> we're going to actually start thinking some of the thoughts of Satan. How, it, how do you like to do that? We're going to go to scripture and we're going to think some of his thoughts of how he deceived himself. God wants us to know so we're not deceived by Lucifer. If we understand his thinking process, we can understand his attacks. Yes. Ask anybody in the military, don't you want to understand how your enemy thinks? If you understand how they think, you can, destroy, you can actually destroy that enemy with a smaller army. So the first thing, the first problem, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And this is in Ezekiel chapter 28. We're talking about the king of Tyrus, which I believe is Lucifer. 
His heart was lifted up because of, his, because of his beauty. That lifted up means he became prideful. But when we look at this, pride is not the fall. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. This primes a person for the fall. You're all with me? Okay. Now, he corrupted thy wisdom. What's his corrupted wisdom? His, well, his corrupted wisdom is evolution. But knowledge puffs up. Do we have to be careful of knowledge? Can you become prideful with knowledge? And once you become prideful, your heart is open, open to the demonic realm. Because that's where Lucifer started to go wrong. Pride. Now, what was his corrupted wisdom? Right here. He would be like the Most High. That's his corrupted wisdom. How did he get that corrupted wisdom? We're going to be talking about that. Satan falls for his vain imagination of evolution. Satan deceives the woman. He deceives the prince of Tyrus and many others by telling them that they can become or are gods, which is evolution. The woman's not the only one that was deceived. The prince of Tyrus was also deceived. They he could become God. Many people in Scripture believe they were gods. Satan is an intelligent being, so why does he believe he can evolve into God? There's got to be a logical process of his thinking to corrupt his wisdom. First thing again is pride. But I believe it's here in Ezekiel. It goes step by step of how he corrupted his wisdom. First, he was full of wisdom. Okay? Perfect in beauty. Remember that. Full of wisdom, very intelligent being, full of beauty, goes on. He corrupted thy wisdom by reason of his brightness. When you look at it, it's basically light. Why would light corrupt his thinking process? I thought and thought and thought. Well, he's the anointed cherub. So in these few verses, we have wisdom, we have beauty, we have light. And we have a spirit being. Are you all with me so far? Okay, so God is a God of wisdom. He's a God of beauty. He's a God of light. He's, got, he's a spirit being. Lucifer, he's, a, he's an angel of wisdom, beauty, light, spirit. What do you got? What do we call that in evolution? Similar characteristics. Evolution is all built on similar characteristics. Lucifer has similar characteristics of God. He's not made in God's image, but he does have similar characteristics. So... Sim Satan's thinking, similar characteristics, he can evolve into God. Yes, this is all built on, why did he, you know, hand of a man is similar to a leg of a dog, which is similar to the hand of a monkey and wing of a bat. Similar characteristics. Why do they put ape-like creatures up next to man? Similar bone structure. <clears throat> Angels have similar characteristics of God. So the fallen angels believe since they have similar characteristics, they can evolve into God. Because that's what Lucifer believes. That's in Isaiah 14. He also told the woman that. This whole thing is, this is a lie started by Satan. The whole thing's a lie. Right here. Satan says, I will be like the Most High. This is another lie of Satan. What he's saying is, Satan believes over time he will get better, evolve upward. This whole chart, when we take a look at this evolutionary chart, everything comes from simple to complex. That's what I was taught. Everything is evolving upward and getting what? Better. That's not what we see in science. According to science, I don't know if we got this book, Genetic Engineering, or Entropy, I mean. You're probably familiar with it. It's got a new cover, by the way. According to science and the Bible, we're not getting better. We're in a state of what? Entropy. Where does the idea we're getting better come from? It doesn't come from science, so it must come from who's the father of all lies. Satan, that's got to come from him. This is all built on lie. We're not getting better. And I was always taught primitive life. I was taught trilobites are buried down here. That means they must be primitive. But when you study the eye of a trilobite, there's nothing primitive about it. There's no such thing as primitive life. Primitive life doesn't exist. All life is very complex. Study the motor on of the powers of flagellum on bacteria. You've probably done that already. There's nothing simple about it. Everything's complex. Yes. So where does this idea come from? That water can evolve into life or the gods. Well, I believe this is another lie of Satan. The law of biogenesis states that life only comes from pre-existing life. That means the first life had to come from God. That's a very scientific statement, by the way. 
So life evolving into life. I can trace that back to Satan in scripture. Similar characteristics as evidence of evolution. I can trace it back to Satan. One kind of creature evolving into another kind of creature. I can trace it back to Satan. Creatures are getting better evolving upward. I can trace that back to Satan. Enough time for this whole process to take place. I can trace it back to Satan. That's why there's no evidence for it. Isn't that interesting? Because it's a demonic deception. You give me 30 minutes and I can mess with your brain. I got a program called We Walk by Faith not by sight. In 30 minutes, you won't trust your eyes, you won't trust your thinking process. I can make you see things that aren't there, I can make things disappear in, right before your eyes, they're there, they're, they'll disappear. I'll make things move, they're not moving. You can't tell the difference from a man and woman on the pictures. I can just royally, you won't trust your thinking process. If I can do that in 30 minutes, can't Satan do a much better job than I can do? Oh yeah. Satan's vain imagination of evolution brought about his fall and the fall of mankind. And the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. What does he do? He blinds people's minds. Yeah. The battle's over the mind. The number one reason students give for not responding to the gospel is evolution. This is by Mark Cahill. Yeah. Number one reason. Interesting. People are blinded by the religion of evolution. I've had atheists run to the front when they realize evolution is false and they got saved. Because that evolution is a wall to prevent people from getting saved. So where did this idea come from? Two major gods and a number of minor gods all evolved out of the water. Well, this is in The Long War Against God. I don't know if you read that book, highly recommend it. So there's this Babylonian book called Enuma Elish. Talks about th there was three waters in the beginning. There was sweet water. And then there's Mumnu, there's water which are basically cloud banks. Then there was the water of the sea, which would be salty water. And so using scripture, I use scripture to put this together. Okay? So this water would not be contaminated by minerals, so this would probably be sweet water. Right here was the water canopy, that's the cloud banks. Right here would be with in the oceans and so on, this would be that of seawater. Okay, now, let me go on. In this, in this book, it talks about there were two major gods that evolved out of the water. Right at the same time, there was a number of minor gods that evolved out of the water. <coughs> Ra, which is the Egyptian sun god, created himself out of water. So why do I believe that <coughs> angels were made, the angels were not made out of the water. Angels are spiritual, they're not material. So they don't come from water. But I believe God made them in the water. Why? Not because of scripture, because of pagan theology. That's where the gods came from, out of the water. Only after the gods evolved did the earth begin to take shape. So after this took place, then the earth started to take shape. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Pagan origin stories all begin with the universe of space, time, and matter. This universe is in some formless, watery, and empty state. Satan did not observe God create or make the heavens, matter, water, and time, did he? He comes upon day two. So, he misses two days. So pagan stories always begin where Satan observes and witnesses. Satan believes if he had a beginning, then God had a beginning. Interesting. If he had a beginning, that means he's just a little bit more evolved than Lucifer is. You see these alien shoals from outer space? These creatures out in space, they're just more evolved than we are. So that teaching is nothing new. Hmm. Now, let's go back to when God created angels. This is what we have in the part, last part of day two. Then God makes the angels. Then after he makes the angels, he makes land and then the plants, and then the animals, and then finally man. Isn't that interesting? Isn't this very similar to what just, I just showed you for the origin of evolution? God's evolved out of the water. Isn't that interesting? Satan has a choice. He can believe God and his word that God created everything in six days, including the angels, or Satan can believe he evolved out of the water around him with enough time for him to evolve. Now we have a choice. We have a choice. 
We can believe God and his word that he created everything in six days, or we can believe we evolved from the elements and the energy around us taken millions of years. Isn't that the same idea really closely? No. We just look around, oh, we came from all stuff. We didn't come from God. Same thinking of Satan. And then Second Peter, verse 3, there's going to be a certain philosophy that's in place in the end times where people are going to believe in to reject the word of God to be true. Peter describes this philosophy. Verse 4 talks about uniformitarianism. What is uniformitarianism? All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. What's the beginning of creation according to evolution? The Big Bang. Slow and gradual process over billions of years you came to be. That's uniformitarianism. Verse 10, we have the scientific description of the Big Bang. It's so hot it actually melted the elements in subatomical particles. That's what it says. But according to the Bible, God's going to destroy everything with a Big Bang and not make things with a Big Bang. What's more scientific? Big Bang's destroying things or Big Bang's making things? Destroying things. The Bible's far more scientific than the Big Bang or evolutionary idea. Reject God's creation out of the water. In the beginning, the earth was what? A round ball of, not molten rock, but a round ball of water. And then he made the rest of the thing out of that water. I was taught they rejected this and the earth stars a hot molten blob of rock. Reject God's judgment by a great flood. Do they reject, is there a philosophy that rejects the worldwide flood? Yes. And then they doubt the second coming of Christ. When this philosophy is in place, guess who's coming? The Bible says God is. Jesus Christ is. And Peter is talking about when this philosophy enters into the church's doctrine, get excited on cloudy days. And that's what Peter's talking about. When the church starts to believe in this, start to rejecting the truth of scripture, Christ's return is close. Yes. And Paul warns us, 1 Timothy, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. I do a program called the Genesis series, where I go from each day and talk about what did God do on that day, what's the science that's happening that day, what's happening on day two. And when I go through each day, we find out that evolution is pseudoscience. It's science falsely so called. Because evolution is nothing new. I can trace it all the way back. It didn't start with Darwin. And when you take a look at this falsely so-called, it means basic false deceitful knowledge. There's a lot of deceitful knowledge out there. <coughs> I had a lot of deceitful knowledge for 32, for 34 years until someone enlightened me with true creation, true science. Let me go on. 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh especially that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of... Is there doctrines of devils taking place today? In my viewpoint, when I take a look at evolution, evolution is a doctrine of devil. Because I see no scientific evidence for it. Zero. Any questions? Now this is my idea. My reading and studying scripture. Somebody had to come up with the idea because man didn't. And so in my viewpoint, this is the most reasonable, logical conclusion of how the whole idea of evolution got started. So which means it takes the whole evolution and creation debate out of the science physical realm into the what realm? The spiritual realm. Which means this whole debate is not a science debate, it's a spiritual warfare. This is a spiritual battle and we have to, bu we have to battle it on that arena. Otherwise we will not win. Yes. Because the enemy is not the evolutionists, they're not the enemy. They've fallen for a lie. I've fallen for a lie for 34 years. The enemy is in the spiritual realm. That's who we battle. I look at these people as just victims to a lie. They need to be saved. They need to hear the truth. Because God died for them. He died for every human being. And he loves them all. Yes. So we need to fight in the spiritual realm. That doesn't mean we don't, we don't have to forget about the science realm. We need that too. But it is a spiritual battle in my viewpoint. Any questions? Yes? Just the comments, it seems very common to the religions of the world who are trying to make people better with reincarnation or right. Mormonism or something, yep. we're getting better and better. We can make ourselves better and become more like God. Right. Yeah, you study a lot of them, that's what they teach. New Age, Mormonism, a lot of them teach that. But that's not going to work that way. Okay, and if you, for your questions, if you'll go ahead and come up to the microphone so that we can get it on tape.
here comes the stampede. <clears throat> I appreciate your good revealing of the source of evolution. That was very enlightening. Well, thank you. Uh, I do have some problem with what was said near the beginning. And when I look in the book of Job, Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, you have the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Well, in the context, in that context, is those are angels. Okay. And when I get down to Job 38, when God gives Job the 77 question quiz, the first question is, where were you, Mr. Know-it-all, when I created the heavens and the earth? Mm -hmm. And when I laid the foundations of the earth, how it actually starts. Right. And when you get to verse 7, it says, when the morning stars harmonized and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So that means the angels are there when God is laying the foundation of the earth. It says all the sons of God. That means Lucifer hasn't rebelled yet, but he's there at the foundation of the earth, which happens before day one. Well, see, that's, that's the thing. How do you look at the foundation of the earth? The foundation, as you know, is the beginning of a structure. It's not the roof, it's not the middle layer, it's the very beginning. So when God is laying the foundation of the earth, the angels are all there and they're shouting for joy. They're excited to see all the things God's doing and he's just on the foundation of this earth. See, that's, see when I do, that's what I used to believe. But when I read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, mm -hmm. it says, in the beginning God created the heaven, heaven and the earth, and the earth was without what? So Form. So that means it's not this earth. When we look at yeah. Isaiah 45, 18, God says, I did not make the earth without form. I created it to be inhabited. Maybe we can do this yeah, later. Yeah, that'd be another thing. And I, that's, an, that's another one using the gap theory. Uh, okay. the, because the word vain there is the same word as tohu. Yes, but sir. The word, but, but the word tohu has a number of different meanings. So you always have to interpret it in its context. Just like the English word trunk. The English word trunk has ten different meanings. So you always have to interpret it in its context. So if you take it out of its context, you can make the Bible mean anything you want. And that's a great danger because in India, they, they've fallen for the gap theory. And so they, how they fall for the gap theory is they take a lot of things out of context. So I go through the context of those verses. There's also one in Jeremiah chapter 4. And again, they take that out of context. Okay. So you have to remember. But yeah, I know where you're coming through from. And uh, that would be good to do my Genesis chapter 1 talk because I go break it down step by step by step and just show how God is building that earth. Okay. So, yeah. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created <coughs> the heaven. Right. That's singular there in our English Bible. But when you look in the Hebrew, it's the same word that we see in Isaiah 65 and in Isaiah, sorry, Isaiah 65 verse 17, when there's new heavens, plural, right, right. it's the same Hebrew word, hashamayim. Right, because the word heaven can be both singular or plural, depends okay. on the context. But if you look at the context of Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1 it's singular, because the other heavens don't come about until, the second heaven at least doesn't come about until day 2. So you got 1 in day 1, you got 2, at least 2, maybe 3 in day, on day 2. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. Thank okay. You. <laughs> Thank you. On the, uh, when you made mention of the different philosophy, ancient philosophies that pretty much teach uh, evolution, 20 or 25 years ago, I had read uh, St. Augustine's book, Confessions, and in there he's talking about, I, I don't remember now if it was like the Manichees or one of those groups that were contemporary back then. And I remember reading this thing and thinking, well, that's the same as evolution today. And I'd never heard that before. I mean, this is like years before I'd ever heard that, you know, the idea of evolution predated Darwin. You know? right. have, have you, are you familiar with that? With, with this section out of that book? Where I am not. So you'll have to enlighten me on that. Okay. But the Greeks and the Romans believing in evolution, yes, I am familiar with that. Yeah, and I think, I think it was like the Manichees, which are Greeks. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was one of St. Augustine's groups that he was like 
fighting against, you know, the, the teachings. Right. Fighting against our teachings. Because right. this whole battle between evolution and creation goes way back. Oh, yeah. Paul had the same problem in Athens, Greece. Yeah. So it's nothing new. Yeah. So, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Rich, for a fascinating presentation. Uh, I have a comment and then a question. <clears throat> My comment is that I know of a very authoritarian source regarding when the angels were created, and you got the right answer, okay, according to the sages who comment in the Shumash. The Shumash is the English Torah together with all of the commentaries of the ancient sages from Israel. I believe it was written during the time of the captivity when our current Torah Bible was produced by Ezra, changing the alphabet from, a, from the ancient Hebrew into the square Aramaic characters. So this is going way, way back. And those commentaries say that the angels were created on day two. It's a totally independent source than your argument, so I thought that was really good what you did. Mm -hmm. uh, here's my question. I know that you have been teaching in Russia, and we would all like to hear what it's like, what you experience over there, and their receptiveness to anti-evolution dogma like you preach. Right. Well, most of the teaching that I taught over there, actually, I taught in a atheistic school. Most of my teaching over there is not in churches, but in public atheistic schools. And over there, this has happened 20 years ago, and uh, we could walk into a school and, and 20 minutes later we'd be teaching creation. And I had a friend that came with me, his name was Lanny, Lanny Johnson, who also works with Alpha May Institute. And we were teaching in this school, we were teaching seven, <coughs> hours, a, we were teaching seven <coughs> hours a day, and uh, what they did was we hit, each had a classroom and they just rotated their students into the classroom. And there was uh, one of the teachers were, was an atheist. And Lanny Johnson asked her, well, why do you allow us to teach in your school? Because we're undermining your evolutionary beliefs. And her reply is, we do not want to spoon feed our students. We want them to think for themselves. Isn't that interesting? And then another teacher came up to me and she said, Rich, are you trying to tell me that evolution is false? And I said, yes. And you can tell her, her mind is just grinding. And then she, she asked me, are you trying to tell me that the Bible is true? And I said, yes. They understand. If evolution collapses, communism, atheism, everything goes. Which means, it points back to the Bible. And atheists who find out when evolution is false, I've had them run to the front and get saved. I mean, literally, run to the front and get saved. And then we had another teacher that said, atheistic teacher, she said, I bet you get into the public schools all the time in America. <laughs> and I said, we fair, very seldomly get into a, a school in America. And she looked at me so puzzled. She said, isn't America a Christian nation? Wow. And I, one of my translators, who ended up getting saved, and I was telling her that some Christians in the United States believe in evolution. She said, no. She said, no, that can't be true. And I said, yeah, that's true. Most, most Christians in the United States believe in evolution. She said, no, I cannot believe that. He said, she said, Rich, you are lying to me. Evolution deals with atheism. E e evolution has nothing to do with the Bible and creation. She, you can't have the two. Isn't that interesting? Here's a new believer. She understands. You can't mix the two. Isn't that interesting? And we would teach over there seven hours a day. We did that for three weeks. I mean, the public schools just opened their doors up and we just went teaching. And we taught in some churches. And I mean, the, the, the Christians knew evolution, there was something wrong with it. But nobody was teaching them what was wrong with it. They were so excited. Yeah, they were super excited. Yes, we had the same thing happening over in Africa. The, the dark brown people over the, the I don't call them black because there's no such thing as black people. They're dark brown or light brown or medium brown. There's no such thing as black or white. They're all just different shades of brown. 
So one of the dark brown pastors, we had a pastor's conference that came up. And one of the dark brown pastors came up, and I'm very dark brown, asked me, what ape did we evolve from? I'm thinking, what? I didn't quite understand that. That wasn't until after I got back to the United States. You know what the old teaching was? That the white or the light brown evolved from the chimpanzees. The dark brown evolved from the gorillas. The, the Asian evolved from the orangutans. Since our chimp was more evolved than their gorillas, that means the white people, their light brown, were more evolved than the, the blacks. And we do a program that we do that we all go back to one man and one woman, basically one blood. These pastors got so excited, they actually literally jumped up and down in their trees, or up in their chairs. I mean, kid you not. They were super excited. They were just liberated. Yes, because getting back to the word of God to, to be true just liberates people. It really does. They get so excited. Yeah. Did you have uh, copies of what blood? We did not. We had some other, we had some other books that were translated into s Russian. But we didn't have that one. That one wasn't translated. So, but we, we handed those out. Yeah, they were, they were just more than excited. Mm -hmm. People are just excited. The youth, I'm really, I'm really excited about the youth because the youth are really excited about this. Yeah. I do camps, and it's, it's not uncommon to spend 2 o'clock in the morning teaching. I mean, when the youth wants to stay up to 2, they'll stay up all night. But I tell them, you've got to listen to me the next day, and I've got to speak, so we've got to get some sleep. So, but yeah, they'll stay up to 2 o'clock in the morning. So I'm excited about the youth. They want to know. They really do. They are starving for this information. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's uh, give Rich a, a big hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. And uh, there are books and refreshments and good conversation with fellow believers out uh, in the next room over. And feel free to talk directly to Rich about anything he might, uh, you might have questions.